Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, you, if you look at the slide, you may ask, what does a lawyer and someone who has a EDD, a doctorate in education, have to share with you? Just briefly, um, I want you to know that um, I spent five years at the University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, working in academic affairs and student affairs and also teaching uh, in public health. Um, and also six years at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center doing the sa some very similar work. And while at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, working with academic support, Kathy Gibbs there, the director, we created a wellness committee. And it grew out of concerns that we had about students in the health professions and the need to bring together everyone from the different colleges and the different health professions, but also the departments, police department, which you were thinking, what do they have to do with wellness? Actually, they have to do a lot because when there's a crisis, who do you call on campus? And so we wanted to be proactive. So that's how our wellness committee got started. As speaking from the perspective today, um, of dental education, I wanted to share with you some the 2017, excuse me, I'm learning this, go back, the 2017 information on the best jobs. And if you look at one through five in 2017, dentistry or uh, was a uh, dentist was ranked number one. In 2018, we're number two. We were overtaken by software de uh, d developers. But <laughs> if you notice though, there are five other um, occupations within dentistry that are ranked um, very highly in the top 100. But then let's talk about the, I always say, what's the elephant in the room? When I talk to students, they ask, is it true that dentists have a higher suicide rate? Okay, this is bothering me. But anyway, so we all know, and you can look, and that dentists have a 1.67, are 1.67 uh, times more likely to commit suicide uh, than the average profession. So having those facts and also some of the recent uh, developments that I'll talk to you about in a minute, it led us to start thinking in dental education more about the concept of wellness. And also, too, you know, there's lots of research out there that does talk specifically about, I'm not even touching it, I promise you, <laughs> <laughs> that talk, uh, there's lots of research, research out there that talks about stress management and the need for us to create individual strategies to assist students in the curriculum and in clinical care to make sure that they're taking care of their well-being. So add to that what's going on now. You know, uh, Dr. David Williams at Harvard, there's research where he talks about that racism actually makes you sick. Discrimination makes, I promise you, you see, I did not touch that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, okay, so racism makes you sick. Add to that that more and more uh, campuses are having to deal with the issue of DACA and immigrants, and they're adding mental health uh, services not only for the students, the DACA students, but also for their families. There are issues, as you know, in terms of the LGBT community and with the Black, uh, uh, the Black Lives Movement, Times Out, I mean, excuse me, um, the Me Too movement, uh, more and more on, on our college campuses, the issue of mental health and well-being is at a critical point, and we're having to add services to serve our students. And so we look at the call to action by Dr. Gull, where he says, you know, it's an imperative in our classrooms and clinical settings to train our students on how to handle stress better and to uh, starve out uh, burnout. Dr. Uh, Valakovic, who is the CEO and president of ADEA, also Adia also uh, points to a 2014 um, study by McGill University out of Canada where they noted that there's a higher level of stress among dental students than their medical counterparts. And you know that goes to a lot of the issues that you've been talking about today as it relates to grades, exams, but also uh, 
the issues of debt, perfectionism, and particularly the pressure for dentists when they graduate to be practice ready. Yes, our students go on, a number of them, to complete residencies, but they initially, many of them go straight into practice, so they don't go to a residency, and that's that pressure to be practice ready. Um, I want to look at a quote from a dental student that we took from a blog. Burnout sucked dry, ev sucked dry of energy and motivation by three years of dental school. of dental school, I feel so empty every day. I blame clinic stress, more headache so than reward. I wasted so many years of my life for nothing. And then all, many of you probably heard about uh, Jawan Lee, who was a Columbia dental student. She was very active in IDEA. She was president of the American Student Dental Association. She committed suicide and had attempted suicide previously. So with all of that going, and that was in 2014, going on in dental education, we started looking more closely the joint, the ADEA, Joint Council of Facul uh, the Council of Faculties to the Joint Council of Administrative Boards, the Board of Directors, all came together and what they did is they started uh, talking about what can we do in the curriculum, what can we do in a clinical setting to uh, prepare students to uh, deal with issues of perfectionism, issues of failure. One of the things we have been talking about is the Stanford Resilience Project. Many of you have heard of it, where students share stories about uh, their failures, but their, there's academic support, there's counseling, and students actually talk about what it means to fail because you know in rigorous environments there are going to be opportunities and it's usually the first time that many of these students have received a B, much less a C. And so it's overwhelming for them. One of the things that we've done at ADEA, the American Dental Education Association, is we have a student diversity leadership program and we, we revamped it this year. What we did is we incorporated a piece on resilience and on well-being and self-care. We stress mentor and mentor relationships and, and every student walk, walked away with an individualized, uh, diver, uh, individualized personal plan, <laughs> development plan, and a section of it was on self-care and well-being, that they had to talk about how they were going to make sure that they took care of themselves. Not only that, these students were interested in diversity topics. So as such, we talked very transparently and very candidly with them that the work of diversity and inclusion and serving and advocating for underserved populations is not easy work. And so you need to be able to take care of yourself and provide support and have support mechanisms. One of the other resources we shared was Dr. Amelia Sam, who's here in the audience today, her book on compassionate, uh, uh, comp on compassionate competency. It was really a great resource for the students because it not only talks about mindfulness, emotional intelligence, but it talks to them and shares techniques uh, in terms of how to avoid burnout and how to deal with it and on re res resiliency. Um, I'm going to highlight very quickly a couple of programs. Um, as an example, this Rutgers stresses their student wellness program in orientation. And so it's not a taboo. It's, comp it's determined to be part of the norm that you would seek uh, assistance from the counseling center that it's, or academic support. And so it's becoming part of the culture to go there. The other piece is uh, culturally infused curriculum in which uh, they have incorporated lectures. I use this course as an example on stress, anxiety, and burnout. And then finally, I'm just, this is just kind of like a smorgasbord of examples of some of the programs that can promote resiliency in dental education. The one that I'd really like to point out is what we refer to as the cultural tax, particularly how Oftentimes when minorities and um, underrepresented, underrepresented group or ma marginalized groups, uh, the pressures on them to um, serve oftentimes in capacities um, and they oh, become overworked, you know, serving on this board. It's only so many usually within an environment. And so you have, it's also true of faculty, it's true of students. You can't serve on, other bo on every board and sometimes it becomes overburdened, they become overburdened and the critical work in the classroom and oftentimes 
as it relates to promotion and tenure, it just doesn't get done because of service and other commitments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sonia.